Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We welcome you to worship here at Tree of Life as we celebrate Ascension Day. Ascension Day is not the day that Jesus uh, returned to heaven to go away from us, but he went to heaven for us. We find today in God's word that he rules there in divine authority for his church. We'll follow the order of service as it's printed in your service folder. We welcome those who are also worshiping with us today via the internet. Today we ask that God would bless us as we worship him together. We begin with our first hymn, hymn number 171, the first four verses. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ reigns as King, seated at the right hand of God. All his enemies he has placed under his feet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ, Christ says, says, I am with you always to the end of the age. God has ascended with shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ says, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Lord is at his right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. Alleluia. Christ says, I am with you always to the end of the age. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are feared. Lord Jesus, when you were about to depart into heaven, you lifted your hands in blessing and promised to be with us always. Even though your word confirms your presence in our lives, we are sinful people in need of your forgiveness. We confess that we have been indifferent and forgotten your blessing. 
Instead, we have sought things of this earth. We have focused on our own loneliness, though you have promised to be with us always. You have promised to return, yet we have grown impatient and earthbound and failed to set our hearts on things above. We have not always been a people of anticipation and need a return to joy. As the disciples return from Christ's ascension, filled with mighty joy, so you also are renewed in Christ's saving promise. As God's called and ordained servant, and in his place and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We join in the hymn verse. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, King of glory, on this day you ascended far above the heavens, and at God's right hand you rule the nations. Leave us not alone, we pray, but grant us the spirit of truth, that at your command and by your power we may be your witnesses in all the world. For you live and rule with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture lesson for this Ascension Day worship service is recorded in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. It is Luke's account of Jesus' ascension. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is God's word. We respond with the hymn verse.
second lesson for this Sunday is recorded by Paul in his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 16 through 23. This serves also as our sermon text for today. It's a reminder from Paul that the Holy Spirit accomplishes great things when he works. Namely, he creates faith in the hearts of his people. We read. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is God's word. Join together. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Hallelujah. And we join in the hymn verse. for Ascension Day is recorded by Luke in the end of his gospel, chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. It reveals to us the conversation Jesus had with him just before he was taken into heaven, and it assures us again of his ascension into heaven. We read, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. This is God's word. So now join to confess our faith. We'll use the words of the second article of the Apostles' Creed and Martin Luther's explanation to it. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom, 
and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. You may be seated, and I invite our children to come forward for our children's message. How's everybody today? Good. Good. Do you guys know what a superhero is? Yes. Do you have a favorite superhero? I have Superman. Superman. I have one. What? Spider-Man. Spider-Man. I have one too. You got another one? Who is it? I got one. Batman. Batman. I got Batman. You got Batman too? You like him? Iron Man. Iron Man. Superheroes have special powers, right? Yeah. What, what special power does Spider-Man have? Shooting web. The web and swings through the city. What about Superman? X-ray vision. You can fly, right? Who's the best superhero there is? Oh. <laughs> Ruined my whole message. <laughs> You guys jump the gun on me, but he, what makes him the best superhero? Why is God the best superhero? He can do anything. Superman can't do everything. Spider-Man can't do everything. Batman can't do everything. They are made up people, aren't they? Yeah. And they're given some certain powers, but is God made up? No. He's real. And he can do everything? That's a superhero, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Remember that God said that he loves all of us? Mm-hmm. So do you think he uses all his powers to hurt us or help us? Help us. Is he always going to do that? Yes. Yes. And what's the most important thing he's going to use his power to do for us? Mm-hmm. Where is he going to take us one day? Heaven. To heaven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes God the best hero in the world. And some of these other ones are fun to read about or watch on TV or on the movies. But remember that God is our hero. He defeated our enemy. Who's our enemy? Satan. And he promised, I'm going to take you to be with me in heaven. So we should thank him for all that he's done for us, shouldn't we? Let's say a prayer of thanks to him this morning. Dear Lord God, we thank you for being our hero, for defeating our enemy and keeping us safe and for giving us so many good things, especially giving us eternal life in heaven. Be with us throughout our life to keep us protected from all harm and danger and guide us to that eternal life that you have won for us. We ask this in your name. Amen. You can go back to your seat. Thank you for helping me. We'll continue with our next game.
The grace and the mercy and the peace of God are yours through Jesus, our ascended Lord. Amen. The word of God for us to consider this morning is the epistle lesson from Ephesians chapter 1. I've read it previously. I'm just going to share one verse at this time, verse 18. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. This is God's word. You may be seated. In the name of our ascended Savior, Jesus Christ, dear friends in Christ. Since 1939, Marvel Comics has been creating superheroes. 75 years. And during that time, I was surprised to read that they have created several thousand superheroes. Some of the more well-known ones, of course, are Captain America, the Incredible Hulk, and Spider-Man. There's a, another rival comic creator known as DC Comics. They're the ones that have created Superman. And each one seems to be in a, a contest with each other to come up with a better superhero. They equip them with their superhero powers and they show how they use those powers to go around helping people and doing good. Well, people seem to gravitate to these superheroes the billions and billions of dollars that have been spent on the comic books and the figurines and on the movies indicates that people are attracted to these fictional characters. Maybe it's just the opportunity to escape the monotony of everyday life, thinking about somebody with those powers. Maybe it's the, the thought of what if that person actually existed and was there in my life. I'm not sure what the, the attraction is, but over 75 years, there have been all kinds of superheroes with all kinds of fans and followers. Our children were quick to point out that there is only one real superhero, and that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's not a fictional character that was created by some writers. He's a real-life son of God who defeated our enemy, the devil, who conquered sin, and who has attained for us eternal salvation. Using his superpowers, he now guides us through life to our eternal life in heaven. We're going to consider the work of Jesus today. As we see him ascending into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of God. That doesn't mean God sits here and I sit here. It's a term that means he has full power and authority. And graciously, he has decided in his love for us to use that power for our good, for the church. So today let's consider what Christ has done for us and what he continues to promise to do for us. In the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he begins in the middle of chapter 1 in the section we have before us today to thank the Ephesians for what God had done for them. Sometimes we forget that faith is a miracle that God accomplishes. Sometimes we like to take the credit for ourselves and say, well, I came to church, I read the Bible, I believe what it says, but faith is a miracle of God, and when God brings together a number of individual miracles into a congregation, it's reason to rejoice. Paul, in these verses, says he thanks God for the Ephesians. I think if Paul were with us today, too, he would thank God for us, recognizing each one of us as a miracle of God, who used his powers to defeat our enemy and through the power of the Holy Spirit brought us to believe in Jesus as our Savior. Paul wrote in our text for today, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. As Paul traveled from town to town and village to village surrounding the Mediterranean Sea, he often met great opposition. Remember, he was working in the 60 AD period, 60 to 65, the time of the wicked Roman Empire and its even more wicked Emperor Nero. Christians had been blamed for a lot of the problems that were taking place in the empire, including the burning of Rome. 
And so, finally, Nero declared that Christianity was illegal. Christians could be arrested, they could be persecuted, and even put to death. And so many times when Paul went into a village or a town, he was not welcomed when he came there with his message of Christ. In fact, Paul was often thrown out of towns, beaten up, left for dead several times. So it brought joy to his heart when he came to the town of Ephesus, and he found a group of people who were willing to listen to his message. As he preached salvation through Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit worked his miracle with his divine power and brought many of them to faith. And as Paul continued his missionary journeys, word came back to him that the Christians in Ephesus were not only surviving the persecution that they were enduring, they were actually prospering. And, it's, and Paul said that your faith was well known throughout the area. Paul thanked God for what was happening in Ephesus because he recognized that it was the power of God that was enabling these men, women, and children to express their faith and to share their faith in spite of the opposition that they were facing. When Paul recognized the persecution that these people were enduring, he went to the throne of God and asked God to bless them. He said, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. One of the reasons that Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians is because he was aware of the pressure that they were under. And yet, in the middle of the first chapter, he talks about hope, riches, glorious inheritance, and incomparably great power of God. Perhaps the Ephesians would respond to that letter the way that many today might. Look around you. Are you living in reality? The incomparably great power of God, then shouldn't the word of God be spreading at breakneck speed? Look at the immorality of the world. Looking at the Look at the conditions in which people are living because of sin and its effects. Look at what's happening out there. Open your eyes. When we turn on our computers, the headlines glare at us about another uprising or a terrorist attack or a murder, all kinds of crime detailed on the evening news. We see the signs and the evidence of the devil's progress in the world. Where does that give us any hope? Where's the incomparably great power of God evidenced in the world, we might be threatened to ask. Well, God doesn't ask us to look at the world just through the eyes of our head. He tells us to look at the world with the eyes of our hearts, with faith. Faith paints a very different picture, doesn't it? Faith shows us the devil attacking people, but it shows us Jesus standing with his heel on the devil's Faith shows us the ascended Jesus at the right hand of God with complete power and authority to do whatever he wants. His victory, as evidenced by the Easter story, means that he now is the ruler and in control of all things. And we recognize by his promises that he is going to use that power and authority for the church. The Easter season reminds us that he perfectly accomplished his goal of defeating the devil, and he is not going to let the devil now rise up and regain control of the world. Jesus has won the victory, he ascended to heaven, and he now continues to rule in great power and with great love for the church. Paul prayed for the Ephesians that they would be able to see Jesus in that capacity that they would be able to look beyond the external evidence of what's happening in the world, to look beyond the temporary problems and the little battles that Satan might be winning to the ultimate glory at the end of the road. He prayed that that picture of Jesus ruling on his throne in heaven with our free tickets in his hand would encourage the Ephesians and us today to continue to put our hope and trust in him to walk beside him, to see beyond the difficulties of life to the glory of eternal life. And he prayed that the spirit of wisdom and revelation would be with them so that they might know him better. Well, the spirit of wisdom and revelation is the Holy Spirit. As Jesus was preparing to return to heaven, he told his disciples to go into Jerusalem and to wait for the spirit 
to come to them. On Pentecost, which we'll celebrate next Sunday, that spirit came and equipped with the disciples with that wisdom and knowledge, and they knew Jesus better. They understood him. They trusted him fully, and they were different people. They took on the challenges of that first century persecution and even gave their own lives to spread that message of salvation. And so Paul is praying for us as well that we might know him better through the Spirit. Well, the Spirit works through the Word. The Spirit works through the sacrament. In order to know him better, we have to listen to him. We have to partake of the gospel in word and sacrament. You have to read your Bibles. You have to come to church and Sunday school. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to work through those means. And as you do that, you have the promise from God that you're going to know him better. You're going to see him more clearly. Your problems won't seem as big as they were. The difficulty won't seem as challenging as it had. And the glory at the end of the road will seem worth the battle. Now, some of these superheroes that have been created by Marvel or DC Comics have turned evil over time. They've used the powers that they had to help people to suddenly hurt people. We don't have to be afraid that our superhero is ever going to turn evil. We have his promise that he will always use his power and authority for the church. Paul described that power and then gave us that promise when he wrote, that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, as we live our lives and we look at the reality of life, we see the evidence of our enemy's power. We see the wickedness in the world, the immorality, the sin, crime. We see the terrible conditions that sin has brought into our lives and others. And we recognize that we really need help. We need a hero, a superhero. We sometimes try to challenge the devil on our own. We fail miserably. We try to obey God's word and do what he says, but the devil overpowers us or tricks and deceives us. Left up to us to attain our own salvation, we'd be in a lot of trouble. But God promised us that when Jesus ascended into heaven, he didn't take him away from us. He took him to heaven for us. He placed everything under his feet and he gave him all rule and power and authority over the entire universe to use for the church. <clears throat> Jesus is the one now that fights the battles for us. He is the one that was fighting the battle at the time of Paul. Throughout that first century, Christians were being arrested, persecuted, and sometimes even put to death. And yet, throughout that first century, Christianity continued to grow. Those who were persecuted maybe had to move away from their hometowns to a distant land, and when they arrived and, and set up their homes and talked to their neighbors, they explained why they were there. They told them about their faith in Jesus, and through their gospel message, that faith began to spread. As the Apostle Paul journeyed from town to town and village to village, he met opposition, but he also found people who knew about Jesus and believed in Jesus. That persecution continued through the first three centuries. Certain emperors like Diocletian and Galerius actually continued the same wicked practices of Nero. They would arrest and put Christians to death. And yet during those centuries, Christianity prospered. Finally, in 313 under Constantine, Christianity was declared legal once again. And by the end of that century, it actually had become the official religion of the empire. Who won the battle? The devil was trying to stomp out Christianity, but all he really was doing was fanning the flame. God was fighting for his church and for his people, and God was making sure that his kingdom would not be lost or defeated, but that it would be protected and prospered. Jesus, while he was on the earth, spoke about his determination to make sure that his people and his kingdom continued to grow and flourish. 
He said, they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Paul, later in the letter to the Ephesians, encouraged them to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. You know, through the eyes of faith, we look into heaven and we see Jesus. We see the victorious Lamb of God. We see him with his victory in hand, using his power and his authority throughout the history of the world. At times, the Christian religion and Christian faith has been challenged. Errors from outside of the church or within the church have threatened to take away the true message of salvation. And yet here we are today as evidence of God's love and power. You and I, miracles of the Holy Spirit, with faith in Jesus as our Savior, looking through the eyes of our hearts into the kingdom of heaven, praising our ascended Lord and Savior, and joining thousands and even millions of other Christians today in doing the same thing. Not because we're so smart, not because we're so clever, not because we're so strong, but because we have the perfect superhero, the real superhero, written not about in Marvel or DC Comics, but in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and St. John. We see our ascended Lord today at the right hand of God with his crown of victory waiting for us. We know that he's going to lead us through all the difficulties of life because he's promised to do so. He promised to be with us to the very end of the age. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. He's promised that he will use his incomparably great power for our good. So as long as we walk hand in hand with our ascended Savior Jesus, we see the victory that will be ours through the eyes of faith. It helps us to look beyond the current conditions in the world that might seem to indicate the success of Satan. It allows us to see the true victor at the end of our life as Jesus will be welcoming us into heaven. It allows us to see what he does for us on a daily basis, giving us peace that only he can give, giving us confidence and assurance that in spite of all the physical evidence of Satan's victory, there's the spiritual evidence of God's victory. Jesus ascended into heaven. That means he had crossed every T and dotted every I of the plan that God had given to him to save the world. It was perfectly completed. He had done everything necessary. He had used his divine power for our good. And because of that, we live in the peace and joy of knowing that we are going to be in heaven one day. Marvel Comics and DC Comics have come up with some pretty amazing superheroes. They entertain us, but we know they're not real. Jesus, though, is not a fictional character. He was real. The Holy Spirit has convinced us that what Jesus did is to our benefit and for our glory. The Holy Spirit has convinced us that through his death on the cross, we have eternal life. There isn't another person that could possibly do that for us. He is far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and he's there for us. We thank and praise God for sending Jesus to be our Savior, but also for sending the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our heart that in faith we see our ascended Lord as our hero. May God bless us with that knowledge now and strengthen our faith in Jesus throughout our lives so that we can continue to live in the peace of knowing that Jesus is always there for us and will be on that last day to take us to heaven forever. Amen. And now the peace of God, which goes beyond the understanding of all humans, will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our offerings for the Lord will now be gathered.
please stand for prayer. In our prayers this morning, we've been asked to include a prayer on behalf of Bonnie Herman, who is the cousin of Patty Johnson. Uh, she just learned that her cancer has returned, and she will be undergoing surgery, and we ask the Lord to be with her. We've also been asked to uh, offer a prayer of thanksgiving that uh, we've been able to have the Neelys with us for quite some time here, Rob and Kelly, and they'll be moving on to Virginia, but we thank the Lord for the blessing they've been to our congregation and pray that they continue to walk in the ways of the Lord. We pray. Dear Lord Jesus, great champion of our salvation, we praise you for ascending to heaven after your stunning victory over sin, Satan, and the grave. We praise you for completing your Father's rescue plan and for receiving from him all authority in heaven and on earth. Assure us each day that because you live and reign, our sins are forgiven, life is worth living, and death holds no terrors for us. Lord Jesus, living head of the church, we praise you for gathering us around your good news to be joined to you and united with one another. We praise you for the many dedicated servants of the word who proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins to people from all nations and also to us. Equip us to be instruments of your peace in our time and place. Open our mouths to speak your good news and change our lives so that we reflect the beauty of the teachings of God our Savior in everything that we do. Heavenly Father, we also come before you today on behalf of Bonnie Herman. In your great love for her, you reached out with the saving grace of your son, Jesus Christ, rescuing her from the devil. And yet we often see the effects of sin in our world. The effects of sin often show themselves in illness and disease. We ask that you be with Bonnie as she now endures the treatment for her cancer. If it is your will, help her to be in remission and to have the cancer taken from her. Give her patience and understanding to accept whatever your decision might be. Be with her family and friends that they too may know the peace that only you can give, that their hero in heaven is watching over them, and that they will be with Bonnie and with all of them. Lord God, we thank you also for allowing Rob and Kelly and their family to be part of our Christian family here for a time. We thank you for the blessing that they've been to us, and for the use of their talents that they have been able to share with us and to increase and, and help us in our worship of you. Lord, be with them as they continue in their new life in Virginia. Grant them safety in their move and happiness in their new home. And may they be a blessing in their new Christian family as they have been to us. Help us, Lord, to recognize all of us as blessings and miracles through the work of the Holy Spirit that have called us to faith and brought us together as a Christian family. Use us to encourage each other to continue to remind one another of the great uh, Lord and Savior we have, and of the many blessings he has given to us and promises he's made to us. We ask all of these things knowing that you will hear us, for we ask them in Jesus' name. In his name we also now join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our next hymn.
now to prepare our hearts for the sacrament of the altar. We'll join together in the responsive sung preface. with every spiritual blessing he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms and placed all things under his feet for the benefit of the church now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever amen, amen. Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after supper he took the cup gave thanks and gave it to his disciples saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sin do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me and the peace of the Lord be with you always amen invited to come forward for the sacrament of the altar as you are directed by our ushers. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given on the cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed on the cross for the remission of all of your sins. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you until life everlasting. Depart in peace, your sins are forgiven.
the true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which was given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed on the cross for the remission of all our sins. Now may this true body and blood of our Savior strengthen you and keep you in true faith unto life everlasting. Your sins are forgiven. You can depart in peace. Amen. of all of your sins. May the true body and blood of our Savior strengthen you and keep you in true faith unto life everlasting. Your sins are forgiven. You can depart in peace. Amen. of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Savior Jesus Christ, which he gave into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. <laughs> body and blood of our Savior strengthen you and keep you in true faith unto life everlasting. Your sins are forgiven. You can depart in peace. Amen. stand for prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, 
we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go forth from here in the power of the ascended Christ who said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go with the presence of the ascended Christ who said, I am with you always. Go with the purpose of the ascended Christ who assures you that he will confirm the message in the lives of all those who hear. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. May be seated as we close with the final hymn. notes in the bulletin for your attention. Tomorrow night we do have a Wings in the Word Bible study at 6.30. Uh, gentlemen, you're all invited to uh, Jack's house for our Bible study. Next Sunday, following our second service, we're going to be holding a congregational meeting. Uh, there are some opinions from you that we need and would like you to share with us, and there's some information we'd like to share with you. So we would appreciate the extra time that you would plan to give to us next Sunday to attend the congregational meeting. That's for men, women, and children. So all of you, we sure, sure love to see you next Sunday. Um, we continue our regular worship schedule in the morning next Sunday. We have the early service at 8.30. We do have Bible study in between along with our children's Sunday school. So adults, if you have the time uh, in between services, please join us for our Bible study. Our second service is at 11 o'clock. Next Sunday, we'll be celebrating Pentecost, the special outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the disciples and the continuing outpouring of the Holy Spirit on us. Were there any other announcements that anybody needed to make? Seeing none, we thank you for being here today. Uh, perhaps I'll see some of you during the week, but I hope to see all of you again next Sunday. <laughs>